something greater than Jonah is here. We have a three-part sermon series. This is the final sermon on that series. First, first title was someone, something greater, someone greater than Abraham is here. The Pharisees say, are you greater than our father Abraham? Well, yes, because uh, Abraham had to suffer three days thinking he had to um, uh, sacrifice his own son. Jesus sacrificed from the days of eternity, and he actually had to die on the altar. Our second sermon was, is there something greater than the temple is here? And Jesus said, yes, there's something greater than the temple. It's my body and it's my blood. So today we're going to talk about one greater than Jonah. And it begins in Matthew 12, 38. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. You know, we want to see a demonstration. We want to see something big. Maybe they were all from Missouri. You know what the slogan of the state of Missouri is? The show me state. Show me. They were of that genre. We want to see a sign. We want something to pop out our eyes. You know, people today on YouTube, you know, they want to get that, um, you know, million dollar hit. Something to go viral. Something that will pop people's eyes out. Well, that's how the Pharisees are, you know, you know, uh, give us a little dog and pony show here, Jesus. We want to see a sign. Now, it's interesting, before that, Jesus had healed a person with a shriveled hand. That's a sign. It's a miracle. It was done on the Sabbath. It was a sign. But instead of seeing it as a sign from God that Jesus is the creator they said he broke the Sabbath. He was getting more popular than they were. He was getting more hits on his social media than they were. And so for the first time in the Gospel of Matthew, it says that they wanted to kill him. They wanted to, for the guy who just healed someone's shriveled hand, they wanted to nail that person's hands to the cross. Imagine. That's the reward Jesus would get. And then afterwards, they started um, fake news about Jesus. You know how Jesus heals all these people? It's not a sign from God. It's actually from the devil. He heals by the power of Beelzebub. Hmm. And so the Pharisees are out for blood. They want to kill Jesus. They ask for a sign. Everything that Jesus does is interpreted as blasphemy. So what did Jesus say? A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Well, he brings up this Old Testament story. You want to see a sign? The only sign that will be given you is the sign of the prophet Jonah. You know, you read the story of the prophet Jonah, there's no word sign in there. But Jesus is now is going to apply the prophet Jonah to himself. Jesus says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's the only sign you're going to get. What did Jesus mean? The sign of Jonah. How is that going to convince the Pharisees? How is that going to convince us that he indeed is the Son of God? And how does that sign apply to us today? Should we also be have an understanding and application of the sign of Jonah, not only to ourselves, but to us as a church? What is the sign of Jonah? Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much that we can be here gathered in the church today. We pray that you may bless us and help us in our gathering. Help us to see beautiful things out of your 
wonderful self-sacrificial life that we may be inspired to give all to you again and again and again until you come in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we all know the story of Jonah. <laughs> I really never pictured it like this, but this week I was thinking there's kind of, in, 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 in the first part of Jonah 1, there are three phases. Jonah gets a call from God. Then he runs away from God. And then he's so tired, he collapses in the bottom of the boat. Because the first part of Jonah chapter 1 is about someone running away from God. And you know, when you run away from God, my friends, you get awfully tired. Because in order to run, I don't know about you, but I used to run and I hated it. Because it's so much effort. It makes you tired so quickly, doesn't it? You know, if I ran from here to the street, I'd be tired already. Running is effort. Running is more difficult. And then if I turned right and started running up the hill, I'd even be, be tired um, later. So Jonah was running away from God. Jonah, God did not tell him to run. So the only thing he had in order for him to run from God was human effort. And, and, and when, you, when you exert human effort, you're going to get tired. And that's what we see Jonah is in the boat. And he's collapsed in the boat, although there's a storm, etc. He's collapsed because he ran away from God. And now he has no power. He has no energy because he's been running, 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 running. And some people have been running their whole life. I'm sure you know people who've been running. Running away from God, running away from responsibility, running away, blaming everybody else except themselves. Running, running, running. Never saying, I'm sorry. Never said, I made a mistake. Full of guilt, full of anxiety. Running, 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 running. And there's a collapse. And sometimes I meet them in the hospital. <laughs> Median, <laughs> right? Finally, God says, <laughs> the, the system says, I just can't. There's nothing more I can do. The system collapses. There's a heart attack. There's a stroke. And you go to the hospital and visit the person, and they're just like a puddle. They're, they're, the, the, the system has not been able to, to, to keep up with the constant pressure of a guilt-filled, difficult life. And so there they are in the hospital bed. And finally, the system needs time to rest and to heal. Well, um, so this is not the sign. Uh, this is actually the pre-sign. We are all, my friends, before we come to Jesus, we are in this sort of human effort, headed towards collapse type of lifestyle. Hmm? So what is the sign of Jonah? Well, we know that Jonah um, finally wakes up, and you have to admit he is um, a little bit more honest than most people today. He said, you know, the reason why this storm is the way it is is because of me. Finally, you know, at, at least he confesses to the sailors who are heathen. The reason why this storm has not quit and has been blowing is because I have been running away from God and this trouble is about me. It's not about you. They said, well, what should we do? Throw me overboard. When, and they say, how in the world are we going to throw you overboard? Because that is going to result in your death. And instead, as the story goes, it actually results in lots of life. You see, the, the, the sign of Jonah is what you think is death actually leads to life. And when Jonah went over that boat, he not only saved the people in the boat, he not only saved himself, he also saved all the people in Nineveh. 
Thousands of people. That's the sign of Jonah. When it looks like death and you're willing to die, that's when life comes in a more powerful way. It's, it's, it, it, it is counterintuitive. How does throwing a person over the, the boat so that he will die save us and the city of Nineveh? Well, we'll see how redemptive this is, traced back also to Jesus and the Apostle Paul and hopefully to us. Well, we know that when Jonah was, 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 was sent into the water, Right at the end of uh, Jonah chapter 1. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Can I hear amen to that? God prepared a fish. You know, whenever you think you're going overboard, guess what? God prepares a fish. God, God prepares. You know, my father used to say to me, <laughs> my father wasn't a Christian, wasn't a believer. But he saw God working in my life, and he said, you know, Jim always comes out smelling like a rose. Uh, and, 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 and when God works in your life, people are looking, the guy's over the boat, but somehow he's saved. And it says, God prepared a great fish, you know, God knew Jonah would go over the boat. God knew that he would not survive in that type of environment. So he prepared a great fish. The fish was hanging by the boat. And instead of the fish catching the man, instead of the man catching the fish, the fish catches the man. I bet all the fish kind of were humored by that. I bet all the fish in the ocean who've been caught, this is their favorite story. You know, here men catching us all the time, and you know, here's, here's a fish catching a man. Hmm. So, when you see a guy go under the water, and he gets eaten by a fish, is that getting power? Is that getting more power or less power? You are just about done. Right? You are done. You're in the middle of the ocean. There's no one to rescue you. And you get swallowed by a fish. And I imagine huh, your cell phone reception inside of a fish ain't too good. Huh? You know, how many bars do I have? You know, not too many. <laughs> No one knows you are in the fish, right? Except one person. Who's that? God's the only, and, and the fish. <laughs> the fish is kind of saying, you know, what, what did I just swallow? God is the only one who knows. And God has a fish prepared sometimes for each of us. I'm sure all of us have been in a fish at one time or another. Places that are difficult. Places that, that we don't know where we're going or how we're going. God has prepared a fish for all of us. Difficult time to be in a fish. Jonah 2.2 from the valley of death, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Amen? Jesus was in the gut of a whale. From the valley of death, where'd that come from? Mm. Psalms 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Psalms 40, 1 to 3. I waited patiently for the Lord, and the, I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up. God hears our cry. So we have this fish type of experience 
In the case of Jonah and Jesus, it lasted three days. But you know, when God brings a great trial in your life, my friends, no one can tell you how long that trial is going to last. I wish all my trials only lasted three days. You know, I can take almost anything for three days. You know, if I, if I you know, okay, three days. <laughs> but sometimes trials last a lot longer than three days. Three weeks. Three months. Three years. Thirty years. Huh? You look at some poor people, they, they've had trials. They've been in their fish for years. Not for three days, three nights. And please don't tell people who are in the fish, it's going to get better. You know, sometimes it gets worse. You're not only in the fish, then the fish swallows you. <laughs> Lots of things can happen to you in that fish. But we do know what the Bible says. That when Jesus comes, everyone gets out of the fish. Everyone. Amen? Being in the fish is not a permanent state because we know when Jesus comes, just like Jonah was vomited out of the fish, that we will be vomited out of the earth and there will be no more tears, no more cries, no more temptations. So that's our hope. The Bible says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is far outweighed by the more eternal weight of glory. Whether it's three days, three months, 30 years, when we're, when, when we're in heaven for the first trillion years, I'm sure we'll look back and say heaven was cheap enough. We won't even remember the trials. Now, after Jonah is in the fish, we know for three days and three nights, so far, the story has followed human logic. But then, the sign of Jonah is what happens next. Jonah gets resurrected from the fish, and he goes to be the most successful urban evangelist in the history of the world. Jonah went to Nineveh after he got out of the fish. He went to a foreign country. He didn't know the language. They were the enemies of Israel. He was considered a uh, low life compared to the Assyrians. The Assyrians were in charge of the world. The uh, Jews were like, you know, nothing. He had no money, no conference, no other church members. No church, no budget. He had nothing, but he converted the whole city from the king on down to the poorest servant. Mark Finley, Doug Batchelor, whoever, <laughs> no one was more successful than Jonah. Why was Jonah so successful? Because he had the power. When he preached... He had power. Where did that power come from? It came from being in the belly of the whale. How, how do you get power? The sign of Jonah is, in order to get power, you must die. You know, I, I hear preachers, I hear people talk about power. We have to have the power. You know, they get the big voice. God bless them. But the sign of Jonah is, is that when God gets you in a trial, when God gets you in, in a difficult place, and you stay in that difficult place for the amount of time that God wants you to be in that difficult place, you emerge by and by with more power. You see, Jonah ran away from God with human effort, and he ran out of power. But when he was in God's fish for three days, he emerged 
with a huge amount of power. That's counterintuitive to our worldly thinking. How do you get power in the Christian life? How do you get power to be an influence in the Christian life? You do it by allowing God to put you in a very humble, quiet, out-of-the-way place. And by the way, it's painful being in the fish. It wasn't like, you know, going to the Bonaventure or the, or the Beverly Hilton. You know, it, <laughs> being in the fish, dark, you know. Could you imagine what it smelled like? Could you imagine dark? Could, could, could you imagine the sounds? Could, 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 could you imagine the fear the, 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 the pain, the dread that he might, the, the, the fish might swallow you that then, and then you would be consumed. I, I mean, the fear. And the only thing he could do was cry out to God. And in that crying out to God, God gave him power because he connected with God. So that's the sign of Jonah is that despite the death, there is a resurrection. And then we have power. You look at every great person who ever lived on this planet. And this is the process they go through. This is how God grows people. Take Joseph. Just one example. <laughs> how did he get to be next to Pharaoh? Well, he had to be sold as a slave. And then he went to prison unjustly. See? It's counterintuitive. Jesus says, one greater than Jonah is here. Let's meditate upon that. Jesus, it says in John 1, 4, in him was life. Now, folks, we don't have life inside of us. All of our life is dependent upon God. We have life on this planet because of the sun. The sun gives energy to the plants. That, 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 that energy is conveyed to us. But ultimately, all life on the planet is indebted to the energy of the sun, photosynthesis, etc. I do not have life within myself. God is the one that keeps me breathing. God is the one that makes my heart beat. But Jesus was different than us. The Bible says in him was life. Unborrowed, underived. He was the creator. He gave life. He was life. There in the Garden of Eden, he showed Adam and Eve what his word had done the previous six days. Amazing what his word had done. Created everything that they saw. In him was life. All he had to do was speak it, and the life came forth. In him was life. How many horsepower were within Jesus? <laughs> I have to tell you... <laughs> Uh, kind of a, huh. <laughs> so, um, I was going up this, my little local golf course. It's, it's the golf course basically closest to where I am. It's called Hidden Meadows. And there's this hill, pretty steep hill going up to Hidden Meadows. It's kind of in a nestled around hills. So every time I wanted to play golf, i go up the hill. And uh, so... A couple weeks ago, um, I have my Tesla Model 3, and you know, it's pretty fast. Um, and this Porsche Cayman came alongside me, kind of revved his engine. I guess he wanted to race. And uh, up the hill, you know, and he went by me, and I kind of followed him a little bit. But I looked up on Google, which one of us were faster, zero to 60? 
And I was a half second faster than that German engineering guy trying to get by me because I have more horsepower. Huh? How much horsepower does, did Jesus have inside of him to make the universe? It's infinite amount of power. Infinite. In him was life. In him was life. I lay down my life for the sheep. <laughs> In him was life, but I lay down my life for who? For us. I lay down my life for the sheep. So he goes into the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. And the sign of Jonah was he emerges with more power than he had before. How can someone with all life Get more power. Jesus showed us. You die. And when you die, you get the power. It's counterintuitive. That's the sign of Jonah. Something mysterious happens on the planet. You know, Ellen White tells us, to give is to live. If you want to live, if... If you want a more fuller life, then you have to give. It's counterintuitive. To give is to live. To die is to energize. If you want to energize your life in some respects, you have to die. What did Paul say? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be conformed to his death in order that I may attend to the resurrection from the dead. You know, Paul knew, if I want to get power, I must die. Because in order to experience the power of the resurrection, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. That's the essence of the gospel. If we want the power of God in our lives and in our church, we must have the sign of Jonah. How'd you get that power? I had to die. I had to lay everything on the altar. That's how you get power. That's how Jonah got power. He went into the fish. That's how Jesus got power. He went into the grave. And Paul says spiritually, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I want to know the power of the resurrection. God miraculously raising my life. Not me. Because none of us have power to raise anything, including ourselves. So I have a question for all of us. Are we willing to lay everything on the altar? You know, surrender is the essence of the Christian life. It's the essence of the gospel. Are we willing to lay everything on the altar like Abraham did? Jesus laid everything on the altar. Paul laid everything on the altar. Jonah somewhat involuntarily laid everything on the altar. But today, God is still calling. He wants to give his church power. But in order to give his church power, we have to give him permission and we have to lay everything on the altar. You know, there's, I, I, I remember reading this uh, one uh, story about Jesus is a contractor. And he goes over someone's house. He says, you know, I have come to remodel your house. And the person says, well, how much is it going to cost me? And Jesus, the contractor, you know, he's a carpenter, right? He says, you know, it won't cost you anything. It's totally free. Wow. You will come in here and remodel my house for totally free? Yep. Well, what's the catch? Well, you just have to allow me to remodel the house. Do you have any references? Yeah, you know, I've got references. You know, um, um, Paul, Jonah, Abraham, Moses. You know, I re re remodeled their houses. You know, he kind of shows them. Wow, Prince of Egypt. And uh, wow, 
Those are great remodeling. Yeah, Daniel, you know, second in charge of, 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 of the empire. Yeah, I, I think I'll take a Daniel, a house like that. But see, what the person doesn't see is that in order to remodel the house, in order for God to come in and remodel the house, you have to just stand back and let him do what he's going to do. So let's say you're uh, following, you know, Jesus comes the first day. You know, they have a lot of um, um, those reality shows where, where they're going to remodel the house, you know. And uh, so the, the contractor, Jesus the contractor, comes in the first day and said, well, I think we'll start um, at the man cave. Uh, Jesus, uh, sorry, uh, that's, that's out of bounds. You know, I, I, I spent a lot of money here. I got the big screen. I got the bar, blah, blah, blah. You know, hey, can't, can't we start somewhere else than the man cave? Uh, okay. Um, well, how about the bedroom? Oh, no, 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 Jesus. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you know, the bedroom, kind of private place, and I, I really don't want you to get in there and do anything. Well, how about this closet over here? No, <laughs> that's the last place I want you to touch Jesus is the closet. Hmm. You know, Jesus never comes in and rips out walls unless we allow him to. And I think we would be shocked at the amount of remodeling we all need. I think we're all, we're all pretty good. You know, we could probably pass building inspector. You know, if the building inspector from the city came in, we would pass. But Jesus says, you know, in order for me to do, in order for you to be in a position of power, in a position of, um, of, of, of a blessing, there has to be some remodeling. And I asked a question for us all. Are we willing to lay everything we're doing as a church on the table? That's what, when, when we're talking about laying something on the altar, we have to lay everything. It isn't part. It's everything. What we're doing, where we're worshiping, how we're giving, how we're spending. Are we willing to lay that on the altar? Say, well, you know, Pastor, I'm 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 afraid, or God, you know, I'm 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 you know, no, you know, <laughs> that's non-negotiable. No, we, you know, <laughs> you know, we've been, you know, uh, no, uh, 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 well, then how how is God going to be the 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 recreator, the restore? Unless we say, Jesus, Jesus, you have the keys. Jesus said, I will build my church, Matthew 18. But we have to get out of the way, say, Jesus, what do you really want us to do as a church? And that includes the pastor as well. Pastor, this is, you know, are you willing to lay down your own plans, your own dreams, your own understanding, and are you willing to go into the fish, to be humbled, to give up some of your ideas, to give up some, some indication that you think you know what you're doing. That's what it means. That's the sign of Jonah. And God has promised those people who are crucified with Christ, nevertheless they will live. And the life I live now, I live in the fresh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Jonah went into the altar. Jonah went into the fish. Jesus went into the fish. Joseph went into the fish. Moses went into the fish for 40 years. The sign of Jonah is that God has a miraculous way to get you out of the fish. Whatever the fish you're in today, it might be someone else's fault you're in the fish like Joseph, or it might be your own fault. It doesn't matter. God can get us out of the fish. Amen? Amen? That's what the Christian faith is about. God is going to get us all out of the fish. 
Some of us in this life, all of us when he comes a second time. That's the Advent hope. Everyone gets out of the fish when Jesus comes. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your grace every single day. We pray, Lord, that we may believe in the sign of Jonah. We pray, Lord, for willing hearts. We know, Lord, you want to remodel our lives, not only our individual lives, but our lives as a church. Pray, Lord, that you may help us, that you may grant us your grace and wisdom, and that in get, getting that grace and wisdom and love, we may extend it to others until you come in Jesus' name. Amen.